Hello world, I'm Nick, and in this video I'm going to be talking about worker services in .NET. Worker services are background applications that can run in a loop. The loop iterates over and over again with a specified time delay in between. So once that time delay has elapsed, then some logic that you've written can fire. Worker services are really good when you have repeatable logic that can be run automatically in the background. It's not interactive. It doesn't necessarily require human engagement, which makes them really good for use cases like automation. In this video, I'm going to use an example of a worker service which periodically pings an API, retrieves the data, and then saves it to a local file that will run on a interval of say five seconds. So we can demonstrate constantly speaking to an API and then taking action with the data in the background. Before we get into the example, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. It really does help me bring you lots more great .NET content. So let's look at an example of how we can set up a worker service in .NET. So first of all, let's start by opening Visual Studio and clicking Create a New Project. And then to create a worker service, we can simply search for the word worker. Visual Studio will give us some templates that we can work with. So we have a worker service project for C Sharp and we have a worker service project for F Sharp. We're not using F Sharp, so we're going to go with the C Sharp template. If I click that and then go to Next, I'll get some more options. So I'm going to call this API Caller service and then go to next for this one i want to choose dotnet 8 so this is the long-term support version of dotnet that is available at the time of recording this video i'm going to leave all the other settings as they are and then click create and here we have our basic worker service so you know we could create this from a blank project if we wanted to but using the template we've got everything scaffolded for us which is great uh, looking in program.cs we can see we have our main method so this is our entry point into the application and here we're seeing a lot of the usual .NET tropes. We've got a builder pattern here creating the services that we require and then running those built services so that we have the project that we need. The class we really want to look at though is worker. So this is where the core of the application sits. So you can see here worker is actually inherited from or derived from the background service class. And background service used to be a type of project in .NET. Worker services were introduced in .NET Core 3 as a way of streamlining this background service use case. But they were around as background services as early as .NET Framework, but now we obviously know them as workers. So what do we have on the screen? Well, we have some pre-configured logic here to actually run the service every one second or thousand milliseconds. But before we go into the execution logic, I want to take a look at the logger at the top. So the service is actually using dependency injection to inject an iLogger of type worker so that we can actually output data using this object. And then further down, we do get to our execution logic, which is overriding the original method. So let's dig into this one then. So we pass in a cancellation token. A cancellation token is a marker to say that we have an intention to stop. At the moment, obviously, the token will be saying that you can keep going, the cancellation hasn't been requested, but when some other process elsewhere in the application uh, indicates to that token that a cancellation has been requested, that will break this loop and kill the service. So to allow us to use that cancellation token, the project has put in by default a while loop to say that as long as the cancellation hasn't been requested, this is the logic that needs to happen. And it really is as simple as that. Worker services are very simple when you first set them up. They are literally a loop that will keep running logic every X milliseconds as long as cancellation hasn't been requested on that cancellation token. You don't have to use a cancellation token, but I would recommend sticking with it because I don't see many reasons not to for basic services. Here we've got a check on the logger field that we've got higher up in the class. So it's checking to see if the log level of type information is enabled. So you can configure the logger to only log certain log levels. It might be that you want to change this to log another level like critical, or you might want it to only log an error. 
It really depends on your individual use case. But I'm going to stick with information because I'm going to use that as a way of showing a, a user, if they were to watch the service, what's happening at any given time. In terms of actually logging the information, it again is really simple. We just call the log information function on that logger object, and then we pass in the message. So we can pass in a string, and that will also accept a array of objects as a parameter. And we're using the current date time to indicate when the service is running. We're kind of taking the current timestamp and saying, I'm still running. Following this, once that piece of logic has been executed, we have this await on the task.delay where we're saying pause for a second and then kick in again with that same token, thus bringing us back to the beginning of the same loop. So the idea here is that we configure this service to work in our favor. So we could change the delay time. If we wanted it to only run every 60 seconds or a minute, then we could change that interval in the task.delay call. We could configure very specific scenarios that say, you know, if this condition is true, then request cancellation against the token and short circuit the loop to stop the service. But the main aim is to take our logic and make sure it is executed in this block. So as I said in the beginning of the video, the use case that I want to explore in this service is to call an API endpoint every, say, 10 seconds, and to make it so that the data that's retrieved from the API endpoint is written to a local file. So it's a very simple use case, but it demonstrates how a worker service can be used. So I need an API to speak to, and you may have seen this in my previous videos, but I like to use a fake API called JSON Placeholder. So it is over at jsonplaceholder.tipico.com. And if you go over to guide, then you can see the documentation on how you can speak to the API and get a lot of mock data back. It's really good for just playing around with uh, API development and it just gives you something to call. If I scroll down to the bottom, we can actually get some information on the fake resources that we can work with in this API. So I'm going to work with to-dos. So I'm going to pretend it's like a to-do list, essentially. And if I click this, I can it effectively creates a get request against that endpoint. So I'm going to keep it really simple, and I'm just going to say every five seconds, I want the service to call this API URL to do a GET request against it, receive the data back as JSON, and then save that data in a local file. Then we could log out to the console to show the user that that has happened uh, and that it was successful or that it failed. So I'm going to copy that URL. And for now, I'm just going to drop this in the class with a comment, just so that we've got the URL for later on. So we're going to make a start on the logic. Before the while loop starts, I'm going to log something out to say that the service has started. So I'm going to say logger.log information, and then the message is service started at, and then I'll do the same sort of thing as below. I'm going to drop in the current date time. So if I just start this, so you get an idea of what the logs actually look like when the service is running, I'll press play on the application and then that will give us a terminal window. And on there, you'll see we get a message to say service started at this time. And then every second, it's logging out to the console through iLogger to say, I'm still running, the loop is still going uh, through its iterations. I'm going to change this interval to be a local variable. So I'm going to create a private field. Uh, I'm going to make it read only, and I'm going to make it an int and it will be called interval. And I'm gonna set this to 5,000 for 5,000 milliseconds. Now actually I could change this to be a const because I think it's just something that's gonna be fairly static. And then I can replace this number here with that variable. So now we're onto the actual logic that we want to build to speak to the API. So I'm not gonna do anything too fancy. We could go and create a class which is a factory that creates the client and then you know builds the request. I don't think we need to go that in depth for an introduction. So let's just write the logic for calling the API inside the body of this while loop, and then we'll test it out. So I'm gonna take this, just cut that out. I'm gonna get rid of that, and then I'm gonna say, change this to I'm going to use capitals so that we can see it a little bit clearer. And then I'm going to say contacting 
API requesting data. And then we want to keep all of our logic above this task.delay because anything that goes below that is going to skip up to the top of the while loop again. Now I'm going to be careful and try and use some best practices around HTTP client because we're going to need to use it to contact this API. So I'm going to use dependency injection for this because we don't want to risk socket exhaustion by con constantly spinning up lots of different instances of HTTP client. So the way I want to do it is register a HTTP client factory with our program so that we can then inject it into the worker and then we can call a factory method which will create a HTTP client for us safely and dispose of it when it's no longer in use. Now in order to register this for injection, I need an extension library. So I've already got this installed on this project. As you can see here, it's microsoft.extensions.http. You just need to make sure that that is installed. In most cases, if you start writing the code that I'm about to write, it should give you the red squiggly line, but then also when you click on add potential fixes, then it will usually recognize that that library is needed and give you the option to install it via NuGet. So assuming you've got the library installed, I'm going to register it by typing builder.services.addhttp client. So this allows me to access an iHttp client factory. And with that factory, I can call a create client function that will give me HTTP client instance in a safe manner. So now I've registered that for dependency injection. I should now be able to go to my constructor on the worker class and inject that HTTP client factory. And I'll just call it HTTP client factory. Create a private instance of that. So private I HTTP fact client factory. And then I will initialize that in the constructor. So there we go. And now that means that I should be able to, to create a client here. Var client equals, and then I'll access our factory. Dot create client. So that will give us a HTTP client. So I'm going to do something really simple. I'm going to create a variable called response. And that will just be the result of awaiting that clients get a sync call and then I'll pass in the URL. So I've got that up here. I'm going to give that a private field that in some quotes. There we go. And then pass it in there. And that should give us our response. So let's just test that out. So I'm going to breakpoint this and then start the application in debug and then we'll step through. So we get our client. That's all good. We've got a client instance there. And then we do the get, we get a response. And as you can see, the response status code is 200. So we're all good. And then it just carries on before waiting and then hitting this breakpoint here and then going back through. So actually, I think I was wrong about saying that it would go back up to the while loop. Essentially, I think it would just delay whatever you'd put underneath the task.delay. So just try to keep all your logic above this task.delay line and also try to spell requesting correctly as well unlike me now i've done something wrong already i've actually started to write my logic outside of the while loop so i think that was because i was writing the initial log so what i need to do is just grab that and then drop that underneath the log line that says we're contacting the api requesting data the next thing we want to do is save this to the local file system. And I want to save it with a unique ID so that we can see lots of files populating that folder. So I've created a folder here called API output. So I'm going to just declare that here. So target file path, and then I'm going to form the target file based on a unique ID. We'll use some string interpolation and we'll go C temp API output, and then we'll call this guid.newguid and that will just create a new guid that we can save the file as and we'll, we'll make it a text file then i'm going to get the response text so i'm going to say response text and then i'll get this from response itself so you can see here the intellisense has already suggested what we need to do we're just awaiting the result of reader string async on the content from that response and then i can simply say file.write all text going into the target file path and the content is 
response text. So what I would expect to happen when I start running this is that every five seconds, a file should appear and that file should have the contents of that API call. So I'm gonna get rid of that breakpoint. I'm just gonna start the application and then side by side, we'll look at the folder and you can see straight away, we've got a document and then we have another document five seconds later. So you can see over time, this is just fulfilling a repeatable process in the background, you set it up and away it goes. It can go and do any kind of automated process. It might be that the process that you're looking to do depends on a specific set of conditions. So your code becomes a lot more complex, but the premise is the same. It's a loop with a bunch of logic that is just executing in the background. If I stop this as well, we'll just take a look at the content, we should be able to see that we've got the JSON that we saw in that original call. So that is working perfectly. So there you go, we've built a very simple worker service in C Sharp, where we are just periodically performing the same action over and over again. So this was an introduction. I think in a future video, we'll probably go into more detail around advanced use cases. Uh, but for the meantime, it really is as simple as that. And show me what you've built. You know, it's really interesting to see how people use these to automate different processes. You could even install them as Windows services. That's another thing we could look at in a more advanced video. But until then, I hope you found this useful and please do subscribe and like the video if you haven't done so already. And I will see you next time for some more great .NET content. See ya.